Hi everyone, so today's iceberg is going to be about survival stories of ordinary people thrust into extraordinary circumstances. Stranded on remote islands, lost in the wilderness, surviving natural disasters, and sometimes even cutting off their own limbs to escape certain death. And um, it's going to be pretty long, so without wasting any more time on this intro, let's begin the video with the very first entry of the Tier 1, Aaron Ralston. On April 26, 2003, 27-year-old Aaron Ralston embarked on what he thought would be a routine canyoneering trip in Blue John Canyon, Utah. An experienced outdoorsman, Ralston had no reason to believe this trip would be any different from the many he had taken before. However, a single misstep would transform his adventure into a terrifying fight for survival. The day before the accident, Ralston arrived early to Canyonlands National Park. Eager to explore the narrow ravines, some up to 30 meters deep and less than one meter wide, he camped in his truck overnight. Confident in his abilities, Ralston neglected to tell anyone about his plans, assuming he'd be back by evening. He packed lightly, bringing only a small amount of food and water, expecting the trip to last only a few hours. By the morning of April 26, Ralston was on his way, biking to the mouth of Blue John Canyon. Around 2.45 p.m., just five hours into his hike, disaster struck. As Ralston descended a small drop-off, a loose boulder shifted beneath him, pinning his right arm between the 800-pound rock and the canyon wall. Despite his best efforts, he couldn't free himself. Alone in a remote canyon, 30 meters below the surface and 20 miles from the nearest paved road, Ralston faced an unimaginable dilemma. He was trapped, and no one knew where he was. Ralston spent the first night chipping away at the boulder with a small pocket knife, hoping to dislodge it. After 15 hours of futile effort, it became clear that the boulder wasn't going anywhere. He tried rigging a makeshift pulley system, using a rope to attempt moving the boulder with his free hand, but the massive weight didn't budge. As hours turned into days, his physical condition worsened. Dehydration set in causing his body temperature to fluctuate uncontrollably. His food supply dwindled. He had only two burritos, a bottle of water, and a few candy bars. By the third day, Ralston began seriously considering cutting off his own arm. Using the dull blade from his pocket knife, he made a few initial attempts, but it barely penetrated his skin. Overcome by fear and exhaustion, he recorded messages to his family on his camcorder, saying his final goodbyes and making a last will. He experienced vivid hallucinations, imagining conversations with his family and a vision of a future son he hadn't yet fathered. By the fifth day, out of water and forced to drink his own urine, Ralston reached a breakthrough. Realizing he didn't need to cut through bone, he understood he could break the bones in his arm and sever the remaining tissue. With excruciating effort, he snapped both bones, using his body's leverage. He then spent over an hour cutting through muscle, tendons, arteries, and nerves. Finally, he was free, but the ordeal wasn't over. Ralston still had to hike out of the canyon, rappel down a 65-foot cliff, and walk six miles. Bleeding profusely, he encountered a family of hikers who called for help. A helicopter arrived four hours after his self-amputation, just in time to save his life. Ralston survived and later became a motivational speaker, author and subject of the film 127 hours julianne kupka on december 24 1971 lance of flight 508 took off from lima peru heading towards pucallpa aboard the plane was 17 year old julianne kupka and her mother the journey started uneventfully but soon the plane encountered a violent storm suddenly lightning struck the aircraft and in an instant it began to disintegrate mid-air plunging into the dense Amazon rainforest below. Out of 92 passengers, Julianne would be the sole survivor of what became the deadliest lightning strike in aviation history. Julianne, born in Lima on October 10, 1954, was the daughter of two German naturalists, Hans Wilhelm Kupka, a biologist, and Maria Kupka, an ornithologist. Her parents had established the Panguana Biological Research Station deep in the Peruvian rainforest. Due to its remote location, Julianne was initially homeschooled, surrounded by the wonders of the Amazon. However, educational authorities eventually required her to finish high school in Lima, separating her from the jungle she loved. By late December 1971, 
Julianne had completed her education and was eager to return to Panguana with her mother. They had initially planned to depart a week earlier, but postponed to allow Julianne to attend her graduation ceremony. By the time they were ready to fly back, the only available tickets were for Lanza Flight 508. Though the airline was known for its poor safety record, the pair decided to take the risk. Mid-flight, as turbulence shook the plane, Julianne suddenly saw a bright flash over the wing. The aircraft nosedived violently and chaos erupted. Her mother's calm voice saying, Now it's all over, was the last thing Julianne heard before everything went silent. Strapped into her seat, she was ejected from the disintegrating plane, hurtling downwards for nearly three kilometers. She blacked out before hitting the ground. When she regained consciousness, Julianne found herself alone in the rainforest, still secured to her seat. She had a broken collarbone, a gash on her arm, and a severely injured knee, but she was alive. Her survival instincts, honed from years in the jungle, kicked in. She knew her best chance was to find a stream and follow it, hoping it would lead to a larger river and, ultimately, civilization. For ten agonizing days, Julianne trekked through the rainforest, battling hunger and exhaustion. She survived on a small packet of candy she had found in the wreckage and drank river water. Along the way, she came across the remains of other passengers. Despite her injuries, she kept moving, knowing that staying put would mean certain death. Eventually, Julianne stumbled upon a boat moored by the river. Weak and delirious, she took shelter in a nearby hut. When the local woodcutters returned, they were shocked to see her, but quickly realized who she was. They took her in, treated her wounds, and transported her by canoe to the nearest village. From there, she was airlifted to a hospital and reunited with her father. In the aftermath of the crash, Lance's operating license was revoked and the airline shut down. Julianne's miraculous survival was attributed to a combination of factors. The cushioning effect of the rainforest canopy and her seat's spiraling descent, which slowed her fall. Despite the trauma, Julianne went on to study biology in Germany, continuing her parents' legacy by returning to Panguana and becoming a prominent zoologist. Reflecting on her ordeal, Dr. Julianne Diller once said, The jungle caught me and saved me. It was not its fault that I landed there. Stephen Callahan in January 1982, Stephen Callahan, a seasoned boat designer and writer, set out on a solo journey to cross the Atlantic Ocean. One night, during a violent storm, Callahan's journey took a perilous turn. An enormous force, possibly a whale, rammed into his boat, tearing a gaping hole in the hull. As the water flooded in, Callahan had mere minutes to gather what he could and abandon ship. Desperately, he inflated a small life raft and dove back into the sinking sloop, risking his life to salvage essential items. Blindly feeling around underwater, he managed to grab a few crucial supplies, a fishing line, a water purifier, a spear gun, and some food. His rations were dismal, only peanuts, raisins, a can of baked beans, a few eggs, some cabbage, and a small amount of water. It wouldn't last more than a couple of weeks, even with strict rationing. Adrift in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, Callahan was utterly alone. Using the stars and an improvised sextant, he aimed his fragile raft towards the West Indies, though his journey stretched on much longer than expected. To maintain his sanity, Callahan divided himself into two distinct roles, the captain and the crewman. The captain made tough decisions and issued commands, while the crewmen obeyed, carrying out daily tasks to keep them both alive. This mental strategy kept him from succumbing to despair, and helped him maintain control over his dire situation. Weeks passed, and Callahan's tiny raft transformed into a floating ecosystem. Barnacles grew on its underside, attracting schools of Dorado fish, which he learned to catch for food. He even began to recognize individual fish, nicknaming them his doggies. Unfortunately, the presence of Dorado also drew the attention of sharks, which circled his raft day and night. Despite his resourcefulness, Callahan's survival was a day-to-day -day struggle. His water purifier failed, forcing him to improvise. Using tarps and balloons, he managed to collect just enough rainwater, barely 20 ounces a day, to stave off dehydration. Even more harrowing, his raft was almost lost when a feisty Dorado tore a hole in it. For days, he fought to patch the rip, battling treacherous weather and performing repairs underwater while surrounded by circling sharks. 
Rescue remained elusive. Seven ships passed by, some as close as a mile, yet none spotted him. It wasn't until he drifted near the Caribbean island of Marie Gallant that he was finally rescued by local fishermen, 76 days after the fateful storm. By then, Callahan had lost a third of his body weight, and his skin was ravaged by the relentless exposure to sun and seawater. In the years that followed, Callahan turned his ordeal into an opportunity. He used his hard-earned knowledge to design a more resilient life raft, which he called the Clam, equipped to withstand similar challenges. Apollo 13. In 1970, NASA was riding high on the success of its previous moon landings. Apollo 11 had made history on July 20, 1969, when Neil Armstrong took the first steps on the lunar surface. This was swiftly followed by Apollo 12's successful landing just months later. As the Apollo 13 mission was announced for April 1970, most people expected another demonstration of human ingenuity and courage. What unfolded, however, would become one of the most harrowing and inspiring tales of survival in space history. The Apollo 13 crew, Commander James A. Lovell Jr., Command Module Pilot John L. Swigert Jr., and Lunar Module Pilot Fred W. Heist Jr. were set to enter lunar orbit and conduct geologic surveys on the moon's Fra Mauro Highlands. Their spacecraft consisted of three parts, the Command Module Odyssey, which housed the crew, the Lunar Module Aquarius, meant for landing, and the Service Module, which contained essential support systems. But as Apollo 13 soared into space, problems began to surface. Two days into the mission, on April 13th, the crew was conducting a routine broadcast to Earth. Everything seemed calm and controlled. Then, without warning, a loud bang reverberated through the ship, and alarm lights blinked on the control panels. Swigert's calm but chilling report back to mission control would become legendary. Houston, we have a problem. It soon became clear that one of the service module's oxygen tanks had exploded, severely crippling the spacecraft. The explosion not only damaged the oxygen supply, vital for both breathing and generating power, but it also knocked out two of the three fuel cells powering the command module. With the primary power source failing, the astronauts faced the terrifying reality of drifting into the black void of space. In Houston, Mission Control scrambled to assess the damage. It was Flight Director Gene Kranz who first voiced the critical plan that would save the astronauts, use the lunar module as a lifeboat to bring them home. Although the lunar module was designed for just two astronauts and a short 48-hour lunar mission, it now had to support three men for four days. Oxygen, water, and power were all limited, and every system had to be meticulously rationed. To complicate matters, the crew needed to perform a series of engine burns to alter their trajectory using the lunar module's descent propulsion system. These delicate maneuvers would require precise timing and the utmost skill to ensure they used the moon's gravity to slingshot back toward Earth. As temperatures inside the lunar module dropped to a bone-chilling 10 degrees Celsius, the crew faced a growing list of problems. Water condensed on every surface, raising the risk of a short circuit in their electrical systems. Even worse, the square lithium hydroxide canisters from the command module used to remove carbon dioxide did not fit the round openings of the lunar module. NASA engineers, working with makeshift materials like duct tape and plastic bags, devised a contraption to make the mismatched components compatible, a solution that quite literally saved the astronauts' lives. Despite all odds, the crew successfully performed each critical burn and conserved enough resources to reach Earth's atmosphere. The tension reached its peak as Apollo 13 re-entered Earth's atmosphere on April 17th. For several agonizing minutes, communication was lost as they passed through the fiery re-entry. Then a crackle came through. Houston, this is Odyssey. It's good to see you. Against incredible odds, the Apollo 13 crew had made it home safely. The mission that was meant to explore the moon instead became a story of survival. Hugh Glass. Hugh Glass's life was like something out of a legend. The tales of his near-miraculous survival and relentless quest for revenge spread far and wide during his time. But despite the many stories told about him, Glass himself never wrote any of them down, leaving the details of his life somewhat mysterious and open to interpretation. What we know about him is part fact and part folklore. 
Glass is believed to have been born in Pennsylvania to Irish immigrant parents. Some say his adventure began when he was captured by pirates and forced to live on the high seas for two years. One day, when the pirate ship was near the Texas coast, he jumped overboard and swam to shore. His freedom was short-lived, though, as he was soon captured by the Pawnee tribe. He spent several years living with them, learning their ways and language. The first verified record of Hugh Glass comes from his time as a fur trapper. He joined the fur trading company of General William Henry Ashley, becoming one of the famed Ashley's Hundred. This group of 100 men set out to conquer the Missouri River and explore uncharted territories. The expedition included other legendary mountain men like Jedediah Smith and Jim Bridger. But the journey was perilous, with dangers lurking at every turn. At one point, the group encountered a large village of the Arakara, a powerful Native American tribe. Initially, their meeting was peaceful, and they traded horses and goods. However, tensions escalated during a long stay, eventually erupting into a violent conflict. The Arakara attacked at dawn, killing several of Ashley's men and forcing the rest to flee. Among those injured was Hugh Glass, shot in the leg during the battle. Despite his wounds, he managed to survive and recover. After this skirmish, the expedition split into smaller groups, and Glass joined Andrew Henry's party, heading towards Fort Henry. As the team's designated hunter, Glass often scouted ahead. It was during one such, such expedition that he had a fateful encounter. He stumbled upon two grizzly bear cubs, and before he could react, the mother bear attacked him. The beast mauled him savagely, leaving him gravely injured. When his comrades found him, they assumed he wouldn't survive the night. For two days, the group carried the dying man on a stretcher, but it slowed them down too much. The leader, Henry, asked for two volunteers to stay behind until Glass passed away. Jim Bridger and John Fitzgerald agreed. But after five days of watching over the barely conscious man, Fitzgerald convinced Bridger to abandon him. They took his weapons and supplies, leaving Glass to die alone in the wilderness. Against all odds, Glass survived. He dragged his broken body across 250 miles of harsh terrain, driven by a single thought, revenge. He crawled, limped, and endured unimaginable pain, eating whatever he could find until he finally reached a trading post and recovered. Then, he set out to track down the men who left him for dead. When Glass found Bridger, he saw a young, frightened boy who had simply been following orders. He spared him. Fitzgerald, however, was now a soldier at Fort Atkinson, protected by the U.S. military. Unable to exact his revenge, Glass settled for reclaiming his stolen rifle. Despite all his near-death experiences, Hugh Glass continued to live the life of a mountain man until 1833, when his luck finally ran out. He was ambushed by the Arakara, the very tribe he had clashed with before. This time, there was no escape. Hugh Glass, the legend of the frontier, met his end at the hands of his old enemies. Yossi Ginsberg In 1981, a 22-year-old Israeli named Yossi Ginsberg set off on what he hoped would be the adventure of a lifetime deep in the Bolivian Amazon. Having just completed his military service, Yossi was eager to experience the world, driven by a passion for adventure inspired by his idol, Henry Charrier, the famous escapee from Devil's Island. After traveling through Mexico, Venezuela, Colombia, and Peru, Yossi eventually found himself in La Paz, Bolivia's capital. There, Yossi reunited with Marcus Stam, a Swiss schoolteacher he had befriended along the way. The two were soon joined by a charismatic Austrian named Karl Ruprechter, who claimed to be a geologist and treasure hunter. Karl invited Yossi and Marcus to join him on an expedition into the uncharted depths of the Amazon, in search of a remote indigenous village named Toramonas. A fourth traveler, an American photographer named Kevin Gale, also joined the group. Despite the evident dangers, poisonous snakes, jaguars, and territorial tribes, the four young men set off. They journeyed by plane to a village called Apollo, then continued by riverboat into the remote wilderness until they arrived at Asariamas, a small community near their intended starting point. Here, the villagers warned them about the treacherous jungle, but undeterred, they decided to press on. The hike was supposed to take six days, but the going proved difficult and supplies ran low. To survive, they resorted to hunting monkeys. While Yossi, Carl, and Kevin made do, Marcus, who couldn't bring himself to eat the meat, grew weak and fell ill. 
His foot became infected, and soon he could barely walk. The group was forced to turn back, but Carl suggested an alternative route, building a raft to navigate the Tuichi River and reach the town of Ruranabak. Once the raft was ready, the four set off downstream. But when they reached the dangerous San Pedro Canyon, Carl abruptly refused to continue, revealing that he couldn't swim and didn't trust the raft's safety. This revelation caused tensions to flare. Ultimately, the group decided to split up. Yossi and Kevin would continue by raft, while Carl and Marcus would hike back to a village. Disaster struck when Yossi and Kevin's raft lost control and broke apart near a powerful waterfall. Kevin managed to swim to shore, but Yossi was swept over the falls. Miraculously, he survived and crawled to the riverbank. Alone in the jungle, Yossi began a harrowing journey to find help. He wandered for weeks, surviving on berries and roots, battling infections, and narrowly escaping death multiple times. By the third week, Yossi was on the verge of giving up when, to his shock, a canoe appeared, steered by none other than Kevin Gale. After being rescued by local villagers, Kevin had returned to find Yossi, organizing a rescue mission that saved his life. Tragically, Marcus and Carl were never seen again. Authorities later discovered that Carl was a wanted criminal, known for deceiving and robbing naive travelers. Despite the ordeal, Yossi recovered, wrote a memoir, and went on to promote ecotourism in Bolivia, eventually helping establish the Medidi National Park. Today, Yossi lives in Australia with his family and remains a renowned motivational speaker. Niki Lauda Niki Lauda was no stranger to the dangers of Formula One racing. His cold, calculated approach to life and racing earned him the title of world champion, but also the respect of his peers. He was precise, disciplined, and fiercely independent, never shying away from speaking his mind, even when it meant going against the majority. That was just the kind of man he was unapologetically blunt and relentless in his pursuit of perfection. By the time Lauda entered the 1976 season, he was on top of the racing world, having dominated most of the year with his unmatched speed. He'd already accumulated 61 points, a staggering lead over his closest rival, the charming and audacious James Hunt. While Hunt captivated fans with his charisma and wild nature, Lauda was the exact opposite serious, methodical, and known for his somewhat harsh appearance. His commitment to excellence was the secret behind his blistering speed. But all of that changed during the 1976 German Grand Prix at the infamous Nürburgring, a track so dangerous it had already claimed several lives. Lauda, knowing the risks all too well, had voiced his concerns at a driver's meeting, suggesting a boycott due to the poor safety measures in place. Unfortunately, the other drivers outvoted him and the race proceeded as scheduled. It was a decision that would haunt him for years to come. During the race, Lauda started off strong, but soon realized he'd made a critical error in tire choice. After the first lap, he rushed into the pits to switch from rain tires to slicks, eager to make up lost ground. But fate had other plans. On the second lap, with his tires still cold, Lauda lost control of his Ferrari at a notorious corner. What followed was a horrific crash that sent his car careening into the barriers and bursting into flames. In just seconds, Lauda's Ferrari became a fireball, fueled by the full tank of gas still on board. As his car burned, several drivers heroically stopped their own races to pull him from the wreckage. Among them was former Ferrari driver Arturo Merzario, who managed to unbuckle Lauda's harness and drag him to safety. Lauda's injuries were severe, his face and scalp badly burned, his lungs filled with toxic fumes and his condition deteriorating rapidly. For 55 agonizing seconds, Lauda had faced death head-on and many believed he wouldn't survive. He was given his last rites in the hospital, but in a remarkable turn of events, Lauda pulled through. Just 33 days after the crash, bandaged and still in pain, he returned to the track, determined to defend his title. Though he ultimately lost the championship to Hunt by a mere point, Lauda's courage and resilience made him a legend. Those 55 seconds of fire and survival, however, would forever define his life. Beck Weathers It was 1996 and to the world, Beck Weathers seemed to have met his tragic end on Mount Everest. The mountain had claimed eight lives during one of the deadliest climbing disasters in its history. As vicious winds roared and the biting cold gnawed at every nerve, 
Weathers and his fellow climbers struggled to make their way down from the summit. Disoriented and exhausted, Weathers appeared to have succumbed to hypothermia, his body lying still on the unforgiving South Call at a harrowing altitude of over 7,900 meters. In the chaotic hours that followed, a mountain guide and then a doctor risked the deadly conditions to check his state. Both concluded that Beck Weathers, a pathologist from Texas, was beyond saving. No one had ever woken from a hypothermic coma, especially not at such a perilous height. Abandoned on the mountain, he was assumed to be lost forever. The tragic news reached his wife back in Texas, and mourning began. But against all expectations, something miraculous happened. For years, Beck Weathers had pursued a dream to conquer the Seven Summits, the tallest peak on each continent. He had already scaled several formidable mountains, but Everest was the most daunting challenge of them all. Driven by an almost blinding ambition, he had dedicated himself to this ascent, sacrificing his family and personal life in the process. His marriage crumbled under the weight of his obsession. Yet even in the face of such turmoil, his focus was solely on Everest. Arriving in the small village of Lukla, perched 2,800 meters above sea level, Beck joined other climbers on a grueling week-long trek through the rugged Kumbu region. They finally reached Everest Base Camp, situated at 5,364 meters, and began preparing for the climb of a lifetime. The journey was meant to test their endurance and help acclimatize to the extreme conditions that awaited. With their bodies conditioned to the altitude, the climbers set off toward the summit on May 9th. They faced the infamous Kumbu Icefall and a towering ice wall known as the Lot's Face. Just one misstep could be fatal, and tragically, a Taiwanese climber lost his life on that very day. The plan was to reach Camp 4 at the South Coal by late afternoon, rest for a few hours, and then push through the night to summit by noon on May 10th. But delays due to congestion on the mountain meant they arrived at Camp 4 dangerously late with a brutal storm threatening overhead. As Weathers and his team climbed higher, his vision began to fail him. Weathers had undergone eye surgery a year prior, which unfortunately made him almost blind at high altitudes. When his vision deteriorated further, their guide Rob Hall ordered Beck to wait by the trail, promising to pick him up on the way back. Reluctantly, Beck complied. When the group reached the summit, a fierce blizzard swept through, reducing visibility to almost zero. Beck, stranded on the mountain alone, remained in place for ten agonizing hours. The storm battered him relentlessly, freezing his body and blurring his mind. Most climbers thought Beck was gone, swallowed by the unforgiving cold. But something stirred inside him. Beck miraculously woke up, disoriented but alive. An image of his family filled his mind flooding him with a newfound will to survive. Despite being severely frostbitten, his face covered in ice and his right arm nearly frozen solid, Beck got to his feet. With sheer determination, he began to stumble toward Camp 4, leaving his bag and everything else behind. Against all odds, Beck reached safety, not just surviving but defying death itself on the world's tallest and deadliest mountain. His miraculous survival became one of the most incredible comeback stories in mountaineering history. Poon Lim On April 5, 1943, three Brazilian fishermen noticed something peculiar drifting on the horizon, about nine miles from shore. Curiosity peaked. They steered their boat closer, only to be stunned by the sight of a frail Chinese man standing on a makeshift wooden raft. He was waving a torn shirt over his head, singing and dancing despite being severely sunburned and emaciated. His good spirit seemed almost surreal. It wasn't until later through a translator that they learned his name, Poon Lim, and discovered that he had been adrift for 133 days. Poon Lim was born on March 8, 1918, on Hainan Island, a small island off China's south-central coast. Growing up during the turmoil of the First World War and a global flu pandemic, his family led a relatively peaceful life as fishermen. But the shadow of war loomed again in the late 1920s, with Japan's invasion of China becoming increasingly imminent. Fearing his sons would be conscripted into the military and sent to certain death, Lim's father moved the family to Malaysia, where they returned to fishing to make a living. But for Lim, the life of a fisherman was stifling. Determined to fight Japanese aggression, he left his family to join the British Merchant Navy as a cabin boy. 
He embraced his first taste of freedom, though he faced harsh discrimination and low pay aboard the ships. By 1937, disillusioned, he left and worked as a mechanic in Hong Kong until the threat of war drew him back to the sea in 1941. This decision set him on a fateful course when he joined the crew of the 5,400-ton British armed merchant ship, the Ben Lomond. On November 23, 1942, while on its way from South Africa to South America, the Ben Lomond was attacked by a German U-boat. Two torpedoes struck the ship, sending it to the depths of the Atlantic almost instantly. Poon Lim, against all odds, managed to grab a life jacket and swim away from the sinking vessel. Exhausted and terrified, he drifted for hours until he stumbled upon an abandoned 8 by 8 foot wooden raft, which would become both his prison and his sanctuary for the next four months. The raft contained a few meager supplies, a jug of water, a handful of chocolate bars, and some broken utensils. Lim rationed these desperately, catching rainwater and fashioning fishing hooks from stray nails. His survival instincts kicked in as he caught fish with improvised tools and dried them in the sun to preserve what little food he had. At times, he even managed to catch seagulls, using their blood and guts to lure fish. Storms frequently battered his tiny vessel, washing away precious supplies and pushing him further off course. During his ordeal, Lim had close encounters with ships, including a passing freighter and a German U-boat that merely glanced at him before continuing on its way. Another time, a U.S. Navy plane spotted him and dropped a buoy, but a storm snatched away his chance at rescue. Each disappointment brought him closer to despair, yet he clung to life with an unbreakable spirit. Finally, on that fateful day in April, Poon Lim was spotted by Brazilian fishermen. After 133 days and over 1,000 miles adrift, he had miraculously survived. He became an international sensation, receiving accolades and even a British Empire medal. Despite the fame, he remained humble, often remarking that his record as the longest survivor on a life raft was one he hoped no one would ever break. He eventually settled in New York and lived quietly until his death in 1991 at the age of 72. Tammy Oldham Ashcraft Tammy Oldham Ashcraft's story is one of incredible resilience and survival. In 1983, at the age of 23, Tammy, an experienced sailor, found herself in a life-threatening situation while navigating the Pacific Ocean with her fiancé, Richard Sharp. The couple had been hired to deliver a 44-foot yacht, Hazana, from Tahiti to San Diego, California, a journey that should have been challenging yet manageable for two seasoned sailors. However, things took a tragic turn when they encountered Hurricane Raymond, a massive Category 4 storm with winds exceeding 140 miles per hour. As the storm approached, Tammy and Richard did everything in their power to secure the yacht and prepare for the worst. Despite their efforts, they couldn't control the sheer force of the hurricane. Richard insisted Tammy stay below deck, where she would be safer, while he remained tethered above to manage the sails and navigate the boat through the raging waves. In a matter of minutes, a monstrous wave, towering higher than any building Tommy had ever seen, struck the yacht with immense force throwing Tommy against the cabin walls and knocking her unconscious. When Tammy regained consciousness, everything was eerily quiet. The boat was in disarray, the mast was broken, and Richard was gone. The yacht was severely damaged, taking on water and drifting aimlessly in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. With no working radio, a broken navigation system, and limited supplies, she had to survive alone in the vast expanse of the ocean. Drawing on her sailing skills, Tammy fought to repair the damaged yacht. Despite her emotional and physical pain, she managed to rig a makeshift sail using the remnants of the storm-tattered equipment. She crafted a small jury rig to steer the disabled boat and used a sextant and a watch to roughly navigate, a task made infinitely more difficult without proper tools or charts. The next 41 days tested every ounce of Tammy's strength and courage. Battling dehydration, hunger, and despair, she rationed her limited supplies, often surviving on peanut butter and the few canned goods that had not been swept away. She collected rainwater whenever possible, drinking every drop as if it were the last. Alone on the sea, Tommy struggled not only against the physical elements, but also the grief for Richard. At times, she thought she saw him, heard him, and even spoke to him. Despite these challenges, Tommy's resolve never wavered. 
Each day, she checked her course, adjusted the sail, and kept moving forward. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, Tommy spotted something she feared she would never see again. Land. Exhausted and emaciated, she had managed to steer the broken yacht to the shores of Hilo, Hawaii. Ricky McGee In January 2006, Ricky McGee set off on what was supposed to be a straightforward road trip to his new job in Port Hedland, Western Australia. The opportunity was too good to pass up, despite the daunting 42-hour drive from his home in Queensland through the rugged Australian outback. Confident in his Mitsubishi Challenger, Ricky began the journey, but what was supposed to be a fresh start soon turned into a nightmare. Ricky never made it to Port Hedland. Instead, he would spend the next 71 days stranded in one of the most inhospitable environments on Earth, the Australian outback. What happened in those weeks has been the subject of much speculation, as Ricky's story changed multiple times over the years. McGee's early life was marked by tragedy. Born in the early 1970s in Gippsland, Victoria, his family relocated to Melbourne when he was young. His childhood was generally happy until his father took his own life, a loss that haunted Ricky into adulthood. He moved between different jobs, selling carpets, fishing for prawns, working as a nightclub security guard, and even training as an electrician. But none of these lasted long. Eventually, he became a bailiff, only to lose his position after a fight and subsequent arrest in Perth. His criminal record, which included drug charges, made finding stable work difficult. By 2006, at 35 years old, McGee was unemployed but had secured a position in Port Hedland. His drive took him along the desolate Buntean Highway, a desert route through the outback. How exactly he ended up stranded remains a mystery. At first, Ricky told his rescuers that his car had broken down, but later changed his account to include being drugged by a hitchhiker. In his final version, detailed in his 2010 autobiography, he claimed that three strangers attacked and drugged him, leaving him unconscious. When he awoke, he was naked, covered in black plastic, and abandoned in the remote desert. With no food, water, or shelter, Ricky faced unimaginable odds. The outback is notorious for its extreme weather, from sweltering heat to freezing nights. The landscape offers little for survival, and many who go missing there are never found. For Ricky, survival became a test of willpower. He knew he had to find water to survive, and luckily, scattered pools left by recent rains were his saving grace. He built a shelter by a small dam, but food was still a problem. He resorted to eating anything he could find, lizards, frogs, leeches, and wild plants. As weeks turned into months, Ricky weakened. Starving and exhausted, he moved to another waterhole where he made peace with his situation, even crafting a makeshift cross in case the end came. On the 71st day, two jackaroos, or farmhands, found him near the Birindudu cattle station. McGee, now a walking skeleton, weighed just 105 pounds, having lost over half his body weight. Despite his harrowing experience, he was in surprisingly good shape, mostly due to staying hydrated. Though his ordeal was real, doubts linger over how he ended up in such a remote location. Ricky's car was never found, and his changing accounts fueled skepticism. Yet his survival story, whatever its origins, remains one of the most remarkable tales of endurance in Australian history. Joe Simpson in 1985, 25-year-old Joe Simpson and his 21-year-old climbing partner Simon Yates attempted a daring alpine-style ascent of Siula Grande, a 21,000-foot peak in the Peruvian Andes. Without guides, fixed ropes, or extra oxygen, they carried all their supplies, relying solely on each other and their skills. The climb began well, with the pair progressing steadily up the glacier. For two days, they alternated between climbing and resting in snow caves they dug each night. However, the closer they got to the 20,000-foot summit, the more dangerous the conditions became. Unstable snow slowed them, and by the time they summited on the third day, both were physically exhausted and running low on supplies. The descent proved far more perilous. While attempting to navigate their way down the mountain, a snowstorm blinded their route causing delays and near disasters. As the weather worsened, Joe slipped and fell, breaking his leg. This injury could have easily been fatal as descending with a broken leg on such steep terrain was nearly impossible. Simon, knowing they were far from safety, 
chose to lower Joe using ropes in an effort to keep moving. This method of lowering Joe was slow and risky, but they made progress. Eventually, as night fell and visibility diminished, Simon accidentally lowered Joe over the edge of a cliff. Unable to see or hear Joe, and with Joe hanging helplessly in midair, Simon was forced to make a harrowing decision. After holding the weight for as long as possible, Simon cut the rope, believing Joe had fallen to his death. Joe, however, had fallen into a deep crevasse. Miraculously, he survived, but with a broken leg and severely limited mobility, his situation seemed hopeless. Joe found himself alone, cold, and in excruciating pain. With no sign of Simon and no food or water, Joe realized that he had to save himself or die trying. The next morning, after hours of yelling Simon's name with no response, Joe made the daring decision to lower himself deeper into the crevasse in search of an escape route. Amazingly, Joe spotted sunlight filtering through the ice and climbed toward it, despite the unbearable pain in his leg. After an agonizing crawl up the fragile ice, Joe emerged from the crevasse, but was faced with miles of treacherous glacier between him and safety. Undeterred, he set his sights on Simon's footprints in the snow and began dragging himself across the glacier, inch by inch, using his arms and uninjured leg to push forward. The journey was brutal. Night fell and snow began to cover Simon's tracks, erasing Joe's only guide. Weak, delirious, and freezing, Joe crawled through the night, desperately clinging to life. By the next morning, he could no longer see Simon's tracks, but he kept moving. Days had passed since his fall, and his body was deteriorating quickly. Meanwhile, Simon had made it back to base camp, where he met Richard, a friend they had brought along to watch the camp. Believing Joe was dead, Simon wrestled with guilt and exhaustion. Despite Richard urging him to leave and get help, Simon couldn't bring himself to abandon the camp. The weight of his decision to cut the rope haunted him. As Joe neared the base of the mountain, the terrain became rockier, making crawling impossible. Joe knew he had to stand, even on his shattered leg. In a desperate bid for survival, he began hopping over rocks, repeatedly falling but forcing himself to continue. He was now delirious, often passing out and waking disoriented. Finally, after days of agony, Joe reached the base camp's latrine, the strong smell cutting through his delirium. Overcome with emotion, he screamed Simon's name, hoping they hadn't left. At first, his cries went unanswered, but after a second scream, Simon and Richard realized the impossible. Joe was alive. Simon rushed out, and they found Joe, barely alive, having lost a third of his body weight and endured unimaginable suffering. Despite everything, Joe thanked Simon for trying to save him and reassured him that he would have done the same. But Simon's decision to cut the rope, though necessary, brought him lifelong guilt. Alvarenga and Cordoba. One quiet morning on the remote Iban Atoll in the Marshall Islands, a married couple, Russell and Emmy, were going about their usual work of drying coconuts when frantic shouts caught their attention. They rushed to the beach to find an unkempt man with a thick beard and long hair, dragging himself through the crashing surf. Eben Atoll was one of the most isolated places on earth, far from anywhere you'd expect to find a visitor. At first, Russell and Emmy thought the man had fallen off a passing cargo ship. The truth, as they would soon learn, was much stranger. The man, speaking only Spanish, could not communicate with the couple, so they took him by boat to the main town on the atoll to seek help. Over the next few days, this stranger told a story almost too incredible to believe. The man was Jose Salvador Alvarenga, a fisherman who had gone missing off the coast of Mexico on November 17, 2012. He explained that he had been caught in a storm while fishing in a small boat and had been adrift for 438 days, surviving on fish, birds, and rainwater. Alvarenga's skiff was still bobbing in the surf nearby, further supporting his astonishing claim. Naturally, people were skeptical. His story gained international attention and authorities grilled him, even administering a polygraph test. Survival experts, oceanographers and adventurers analyzed his account and found it remarkably accurate. His boss back in Mexico confirmed that Alvarenga had indeed gone missing on the very day he claimed. As the pieces fell into place, the world had to accept the truth. Jose Salvador Alvarenga had survived one of the most improbable journeys in human history. Alvarenga's journey had begun as a simple two-day fishing trip. 
His regular fishing partner canceled at the last minute, so 23-year-old Ezekiel Cordoba joined him. The weather started out fine, and they hauled in an impressive catch, but the weather quickly turned. A powerful storm hit, and for five days, the men battled the elements. Waves slammed their boat, and they were forced to toss their catch overboard to avoid capsizing. The storm destroyed their radio and GPS, leaving them stranded. Although Alvarenga managed to send out an SOS before the equipment died, rescue efforts failed to locate the tiny, powerless boat. For days they drifted with no food or water. Eventually they found ways to survive by catching fish and collecting rainwater. They also captured birds and even drank their blood when necessary. Four months into the ordeal, Cordoba became ill after eating a poisoned seabird and tragically died. Heartbroken, Alvarenga was left completely alone for the next ten months. He drifted across the Pacific, sometimes spotting distant ships, but no one ever saw him. Finally, in early 2014, Alvarenga's skiff washed ashore on Eban Atoll. Exhausted but alive, he had survived 438 days lost at sea, enduring one of the most remarkable feats of human survival ever recorded. Vesna Vulovic Vesna Vulovic's story is one of both survival and mystery filled with incredible odds and a mix of emotions. Born in Belgrade in 1950, Vesna was an ordinary young woman with dreams of traveling the world. After a stint in the UK to study English, she returned to Serbia and was inspired by a friend to become a flight attendant. Despite having low blood pressure, she drank several cups of coffee to pass her medical exam and was accepted by Yugoslavia's national airline, JAT. On January 26, 1972, Vesna's life changed forever when she boarded JAT Flight 367. The flight was scheduled to fly from Stockholm to Belgrade, with stops in Copenhagen and Zagreb. Vesna was part of the replacement crew, boarding the plane in Copenhagen for the final leg of the journey. As the plane took off, everything seemed normal until, at around 4 p.m., an explosion tore through the aircraft while it was flying over Czechoslovakia. The plane disintegrated mid-air, and debris rained down onto a snowy forest. Vesna was the sole survivor of the crash. She was found alive by Bruno Honke, a former World War II medic who was nearby and heard her screams from the wreckage. Vesna was discovered in the tail section of the plane, pinned by a food cart, which may have shielded her from being sucked out of the aircraft. Being in the tail section helped cushion the fall and the snow-covered forest provided additional softening. Doctors believed Vesna's low blood pressure saved her life, as it caused her to pass out quickly and prevented her heart from failing during the fall. Her survival, however, came at a heavy cost. She sustained multiple injuries, including broken legs, a fractured skull, and a shattered spine. Initially paralyzed, Vesna eventually regained the ability to walk after months of rehabilitation. Vesna's survival story made her an instant celebrity. She was celebrated by Yugoslavia's leader, Tito, and became the holder of the Guinness World Record for the highest fall without a parachute. She received honors, and her fame grew internationally. However, despite the external glory, Vesna struggled with the emotional aftermath of the accident. She experienced survivor's guilt, often wondering why she lived when 27 others on the flight did not. In later years, she expressed her belief that a passenger who angrily left the plane in Copenhagen might have been responsible for planting the bomb that caused the explosion. Croatian nationalists claimed responsibility for the bombing, but no one was ever charged. Vesna Vulovic lived the rest of her life quietly, avoiding public attention. She passed away in 2016 at the age of 66 in her Belgrade apartment. Ada Blackjack Ada Blackjack, born Ada Telegic in 1898 in Spruce Creek, Alaska, was an Inupiat woman who lived an extraordinary life. Though raised by Methodist missionaries, she did not learn the traditional survival skills of her people. Instead, she was taught English, the Bible, and housekeeping skills. At 16, Ada married a dog musher named Jack Blackjack, with whom she had three children, though only one survived infancy, a son named Bennett. In 1921, Jack abandoned Ada and Bennett in the harsh wilderness of Alaska, leaving Ada to walk 40 miles to safety with her ill son. Bennett suffered from tuberculosis, and Ada, unable to care for him, had to place him in an orphanage temporarily. Devastated, she vowed to work hard to save enough money to bring him home. 
Later that year, Ada learned of an expedition led by Arctic explorer Vilhelmer Stephenson to colonize Wrangell Island. Although the Canadian and British governments declined to support the mission, Stephenson assembled a team of four men, Alan Crawford, Fred Moore, Milton Gall, and Lorne Knight. Ada was recruited as the team's seamstress, offered $50 per month to sew survival gear during the one-year mission. Desperate to earn money to care for her son, Ada reluctantly joined, despite her fears. On September 9, 1921, the group set off for Rangel Island, and after a week at sea, they arrived. They planted the British flag as instructed by Stephenson, despite the island being Russian territory. However, things quickly went awry. The team's sled dogs were weak, and much of their food had spoiled. Still, they remained hopeful, trusting Stephenson's assurance that the island had ample game. The harsh Arctic environment soon took its toll. Ada struggled with homesickness and fear of polar bears, even developing Arctic hysteria, but she eventually pulled through. As the polar night set in, the group faced freezing temperatures and dwindling food supplies. In January 1923, with Knight gravely ill from scurvy and their stores nearly depleted, Crawford, Moore, and Gale set out to seek help, leaving Ada behind to care for Knight. The men were never seen again. Alone with Knight and a cat named Vic, Ada did her best to care for the sick man, though he frequently mistreated her. Despite this, Ada hunted, trapped foxes, and maintained the camp. Knight's health continued to deteriorate, and he died in June 1923. Ada recorded his death and continued her solitary existence, improving her hunting and survival skills. On August 10, 1923, nearly two years after their arrival, Ada was rescued by a team led by Harold Noyce. She was hailed as the female Robinson Crusoe, but the media attention was unwanted. Ada was finally reunited with her son, though her later years were marked by poverty and sadness. She lived a quiet life in Alaska and passed away in 1983 at the age of 85. The Donner Party the Donner Party's tragic westward journey is one of the most infamous tales from the era of westward expansion, particularly during the California Gold Rush. In 1846, this group of pioneers, led by brothers George and Jacob Donner along with their friend James Reed, set out to reach California. Unfortunately, their journey turned into a nightmare, one marked by delays, poor decisions, and a devastating end where survival meant resorting to cannibalism. One of the first critical mistakes the Donner Party made was starting their journey too late in the season. The ideal time for pioneers to head west was in mid-April, giving them ample time to cross the plains before the harsh winter set in. The Donner Party, however, didn't begin their trek until May 12th. While this month-long delay might seem insignificant, it would prove disastrous when they reached the treacherous Sierra Nevada Mountains. Early into the journey, they faced their first obstacle, the Big Blue River, swollen by heavy rains. The river, which cut through parts of Nebraska and Kansas, had risen over 20 feet, delaying their progress. The group spent days building rafts to ferry their wagons across the raging waters. Tragically, Sarah Keyes, an elderly member of the party, succumbed to tuberculosis before they could move on. Another miscalculation came with their food supply. They packed enough food to last about four months, which would have been sufficient if everything had gone according to plan. However, unforeseen delays stretched the journey, and their meager provisions of flour, meat, and basic staples like beans and cornmeal soon dwindled. As their journey dragged on, hunger became a constant companion. Perhaps their most fatal decision was choosing to take an untested route known as the Hastings Cutoff. Lansford Hastings, an ambitious promoter of westward expansion, had written a guidebook that promised this shortcut would shave off 300 miles from the trip to California. Although the party was warned by an experienced traveler, James Kleiman, that the Hastings cutoff was nearly impassable, they ignored his advice and decided to gamble on the supposedly quicker route. Unbeknownst to them, Hastings himself had never even taken the route with wagons and the path was fraught with dangers. Their troubles compounded when they reached the Great Salt Desert. Crossing the desert was a grueling ordeal as wagons became stuck in the sand and oxen weakened from thirst and exhaustion. Many of the animals were left to die or fled, further depleting the party's resources. As if this weren't enough, 
Their cattle were frequently stolen by Native American tribes, reducing their already scarce food supply. By the time the Donner Party reached the Sierra Nevada in late October, an early snowstorm trapped them. With their path blocked, the group had no choice but to set up camp and wait out the winter. As their food supply ran out, they initially survived by eating cow hides and bones, but eventually they were forced to cannibalize those who had died. In the end, only 48 of the original 87 members of the Donner Party survived to reach California. Phineas Gage. Born in 1823 in Vermont, he was a railroad construction foreman known for his hardworking nature and strong character. Gage was a familiar figure in his community, often described as energetic, ambitious, and well-liked by his peers. His life took a dramatic turn on September 13, 1848, when he experienced an accident that would change not only his life, but also the field of psychology forever. On that fateful day, Gage and his crew were working on the Rutland and Burlington Railroad. They were tasked with blasting rock to clear a path for the railway. As was common practice, Gage prepared a hole for the explosive charge using a tamping iron, a long, heavy iron rod. Unfortunately, while he was packing the powder, he accidentally caused a spark, igniting the explosive. In a split second, the tamping iron was propelled through his skull, entering below his left cheekbone and exiting through the top of his head. The rod, measuring nearly three feet long and weighing 13 pounds, flew over 30 yards away. Miraculously, Gage survived the accident. His fellow workers, initially horrified, rushed him to the nearest doctor, where they feared the worst. However, Gage remained conscious and coherent. He was able to speak, and despite the severity of his injury, he seemed to retain his memory and cognitive abilities. The doctors worked to clean the wounds and tend to his injuries, but they could hardly have imagined the profound impact this event would have on his life and science. In the weeks following the accident, Gage's recovery was remarkable. However, it soon became clear that he was not the same man he once was. The damage to his frontal lobes, critical areas of the brain responsible for personality, decision-making, and social behavior, resulted in drastic changes to his character. He became impulsive, irritable, and irresponsible, often engaging in behavior that shocked his friends and family. Gage, who had once been a responsible foreman, found it difficult to hold down a job, and his relationships deteriorated as those close to him struggled to understand the man he had become. After several years of wandering and searching for a new purpose, Gage eventually moved to San Francisco, where he found work in a livery stable. Although he continued to experience challenges, he managed to build a new life for himself, engaging with the community and finding moments of joy amid his struggles. Gage passed away in 1860, at the age of 36. Lincoln Hall. Lincoln Hall was a climber celebrated for his mountaineering skills, yet only marginally known as an author despite having written several books. His story of survival on Mount Everest is nothing short of miraculous. In 2006, at the age of 56, Hall attempted to summit Everest once again, more than two decades after his first unsuccessful attempt. Little did he know that this climb would lead him to one of the most harrowing survival experiences ever recorded. Hall began rock climbing at the age of 15 and was quickly captivated by the challenges of the sport. His love for climbing took him to the heights of New Zealand, the Andes, and beyond. He even became part of the first Australian Everest team in 1984, although he narrowly missed reaching the summit. Over the years, Hall continued to climb and wrote several mountaineering books, with his most famous being White Limbo, a classic in the genre. He lived with his wife Barbara and two sons, Dylan and George, in New South Wales, Australia. In 2006, Hall was invited by Sherpa guides to make another attempt at Everest, and after years of hesitation, he accepted the challenge. However, the climb was fraught with difficulty. Hall and his team received grim news as they approached the summit, Several climbers had perished along the way, including British climber David Sharp, who died only 300 meters from the top. Sharp's death weighed heavily on Hall's mind, adding a sense of dread to his own journey. Despite these ominous signs, Hall successfully reached the summit of Everest. But on his descent, he was struck by cerebral edema, a severe swelling of the brain that caused him to hallucinate 
and collapse. His Sherpa guides worked tirelessly to save him, but after hours of effort and no response, they believed him to be dead. They reluctantly left him behind to save themselves, reporting his death to Hall's family. For 12 hours, Lincoln Hall lay in what is known as the death zone, a region so high that the oxygen is too thin to sustain human life. Most climbers who remain there for long periods do not survive. Yet against all odds, Hall did. The next morning, climber Dan Mazur and his team found him, alive but severely frostbitten and disoriented. When they approached him, Hall greeted them with surprising calm, saying, I imagine you're surprised to see me. Hall's survival was remarkable. He had spent the night without oxygen, proper clothing, or shelter in one of the most dangerous environments on Earth. Driven by the thought of his family, he refused to give in to death. After being rescued, Hall was able to speak to his wife and eventually made a long and arduous descent to safety. Despite surviving Everest, Hall's life ended in 2012 due to mesothelioma, a disease linked to asbestos exposure in his childhood. But his legacy as the man who cheated death on Everest lives on, with his gear displayed in the Australian National Museum. Debbie Kiley Deborah, an experienced sailor born in Texas in 1958, had grown up around boats, honing her skills from a young age. By 25, she had already completed the prestigious Whitbread Round the World race, a remarkable achievement. She was part of a five-person crew aboard the 58-foot yacht, the Trashman, hired to sail from Maine to Florida. The journey was expected to take six days. The crew was in high spirits as they departed, enjoying favorable weather on the first leg of the trip. But the calm was short-lived. After stopping in Annapolis, Maryland, they set off again, only to encounter a powerful tropical storm off the coast of North Carolina. The waves surged to 30 to 50 feet, and the wind howled at 70 miles per hour. The captain, John Lippeth, had been drinking heavily and fell asleep at the helm as the boat began to take on water. Deborah awoke in the middle of the night to find chaos. The boat was flooding, and the crew was in a panic. As the vessel capsized, the crew scrambled to inflate a small life raft. Deborah along with crewmates Brad Kavanaugh, Mark Adams, and Meg Mooney, managed to climb into the raft, but they were now stranded in shark-infested waters. To make matters worse, Meg had suffered a deep cut on her leg, and the smell of blood attracted a frenzy of sharks. The group watched in horror as dozens of sharks circled their raft, bumping against it, seemingly waiting for the right moment. Days passed, and the crew's situation worsened. Without food or fresh water, they grew weak and dehydrated. Meg's wound became infected, and she began to suffer from blood poisoning. The infection spread rapidly, causing her to hallucinate. John, too, became delusional from dehydration, and in a fit of madness, he jumped overboard, mistakenly believing he could swim to land. The sharks got to him within moments. As the days dragged on, the surviving crew members struggled to stay alive. Mark succumbed to the same delusions as John, throwing himself into the sea, where the sharks claimed him. Meg's infection finally overcame her, and she died on the raft. Deborah and Brad, the last two survivors, were forced to make the heartbreaking decision to cast Meg's body into the ocean. In a miraculous turn of events, a Russian cargo ship spotted their small raft and rescued them after five grueling days at sea. Though Deborah survived, the ordeal left a lasting impact. She went on to share her story through motivational speaking and her book, Albatross, before passing away in 2012. Bear Grylls' Freefall Incident Bear Grylls, known worldwide for his survival skills and television shows, experienced his own terrifying brush with death in 1996 when a routine parachute jump went horribly wrong. At the time, Grylls was serving with the British Special Air Service and was undergoing advanced parachute training. The incident that nearly claimed his life left him with a broken back and put his future in jeopardy, but also helped shape his enduring reputation as a man of resilience and grit. During a routine jump over southern Africa, Grills was performing a free-fall parachute exercise from 16,000 feet. In such exercises, parachutists fall for several seconds before deploying their parachutes. However, on this particular jump, things did not go as planned. As Grills pulled his parachute ripcord, the main chute failed to open correctly. It only partially deployed, causing a canopy collapse, 
a terrifying situation where the parachute becomes tangled or twisted, severely impairing its ability to slow the descent. With the main chute malfunctioning, Grills was forced to deploy his reserve parachute. But by then, it was too late to avoid disaster. He was still falling at a dangerous speed and had very little time to correct the situation. His body slammed into the desert floor with tremendous force, and the impact was catastrophic. Grills immediately knew something was terribly wrong. The force of the fall had crushed three vertebrae in his back. Although conscious, he was left paralyzed and in excruciating pain. His SAS colleagues and emergency responders rushed to his aid, stabilizing him before transporting him to a hospital. The injury was severe, and doctors told him that he was lucky to have survived the fall at all. They warned him that he might never walk again, let alone return to the active, adventurous life he had always known. For months, Grills was confined to bed, his body held together by metal braces. The injury had fractured his T8, T10, and T12 vertebrae, which are crucial for movement and support. The recovery process was grueling and uncertain. It took time for Grills to regain feeling and movement in his lower body, and his future as a soldier and adventurer seemed bleak. But Bear Grills refused to give up. With a combination of determination, physical therapy, and a positive mindset, he fought his way back to health. Within 18 months of the accident, he achieved a seemingly impossible goal. Grills climbed Mount Everest in 1998 at the age of 23, becoming one of the youngest Britons ever to reach the summit. This remarkable feat, just two years after an injury that had nearly left him paralyzed, even further proved his reputation as someone with extraordinary physical and mental resilience. Ernest Shackleton. In 1914, Sir Ernest Shackleton, a seasoned polar explorer, set his sights on a daring new challenge, to be the first to cross the entire Antarctic continent. Though Shackleton had previously led two major Antarctic expeditions, his ambitions were stoked by the knowledge that Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen had already claimed the prize of reaching the South Pole in 1911. Shackleton's new goal, the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition, would involve two parties and two ships. One party, led by Shackleton, would sail aboard the Endurance to the Weddell Sea, while the other, aboard the Aurora, would lay supply depots on the opposite side of the continent. The Endurance, a sturdy 300-ton vessel originally designed for Arctic cruises, set sail in August 1914, just after the outbreak of World War I. Despite concerns, Shackleton received orders from Winston Churchill, then First Lord of the Admiralty, to continue with the expedition. After several months of preparation and stops in Buenos Aires and South Georgia, Shackleton and his crew began their Antarctic voyage in December 1914. Early into the journey, they encountered pack ice far north of where Shackleton had expected. The Endurance struggled to make progress through the dense ice, and by January 1915, it was halted just 200 miles from their intended landing site. Trapped by thick ice flows, the ship became immobilized. Attempts to free the vessel proved fruitless, and Shackleton ultimately decided to extinguish the ship's boilers, allowing it to drift with the ice. For the next several months, the crew of the Endurance settled into life aboard the trapped ship, passing the harsh Antarctic winter by exercising on the ice and keeping spirits up with celebrations and music. However, as winter turned to spring, the ice began to shift and press against the ship with alarming force. By late October, the Endurance had suffered significant damage and water began flooding in. On October 24, 1915, Shackleton gave the order to abandon ship. The crew, now stranded on the ice, established a camp and salvaged what supplies they could from the sinking Endurance. As the ship finally slipped beneath the ice in November, the men faced a new challenge, survival. Attempts to drag lifeboats northward across the ice proved too difficult and Shackleton and his men were forced to camp on the ice, subsisting on seal meat and waiting for an opportunity to escape. By April 1916, the drifting ice had brought them close to Elephant Island, a remote and desolate landmass. Launching their lifeboats, the men made it to solid ground for the first time in nearly 500 days. But Shackleton knew they couldn't survive there indefinitely. On April 24th, he and five others set out in a lifeboat for South Georgia, navigating 800 miles of treacherous ocean. 
After two weeks at sea, they miraculously reached South Georgia. Shackleton then led a dangerous overland trek to a whaling station, where they finally secured help. After multiple rescue attempts, the rest of the crew was saved in August 1916. Against all odds, all 28 members of the expedition survived. Louis Zamperini Louis Zamperini's life story is one of incredible resilience, faith, and transformation. Born to Italian immigrants, Louis grew up as a rebellious boy in California, but found his calling in running. His talent eventually led him to compete in the 1936 Berlin Olympics as a distance runner. However, his life took a dramatic turn when World War II broke out. During the war, Zamperini served as a bombardier on a B-24 Liberator. In May 1943, during a search and rescue mission over the Pacific, his plane malfunctioned and crashed into the ocean. Of the 11 crew members, only Louis, the pilot Russell Allen Phillips, and the tail gunner Francis McNamara survived. They were left stranded on a small raft in the middle of the vast Pacific Ocean. For 47 days, they battled starvation, dehydration, and shark attacks, drifting thousands of miles. Tragically, McNamara did not survive the ordeal, succumbing to the harsh conditions after 33 days. In those desperate moments, despite not being religious, Louis found himself turning to prayer. He promised God that if he survived, he would dedicate his life to serving him. On the 47th day, Louis and Phillips were captured by a Japanese patrol and taken to a series of brutal prisoner of war camps. For the next two years, Zamperini faced unimaginable suffering. He endured beatings, starvation, and daily humiliation. One of the most notorious figures in his story was Mutsuhiro Watanabe, a prison guard known as The Bird, who took a particular interest in tormenting Louis. Watanabe's cruelty was extreme, and he subjected Louis and other prisoners to relentless abuse, leaving them physically and emotionally broken. Despite being liberated at the end of the war, Louis' battle was far from over. He returned home a hero but struggled with post-traumatic stress disorder. Nightmares of Watanabe haunted him, and his heart was filled with anger and a desire for revenge. To cope, Louis turned to alcohol, which strained his marriage to his wife Cynthia. At the brink of divorce, Cynthia invited Louis to attend a Billy Graham crusade in 1949. There, Louis had a spiritual awakening. He remembered the promise he had made to God on the raft and chose to forgive his enemies, including Watanabe. This decision transformed Louis' life. His nightmares ceased, and he replaced his hatred with forgiveness. In 1952, Louis even traveled to Japan to forgive his former captors, though he never got to meet Watanabe, who had gone into hiding. Despite never confronting Watanabe face to face, Louis wrote him a letter offering his forgiveness and urging him to find peace in God. In his later years, Louis became a Christian speaker and founded the Victory Boys Camp to help troubled youth. His story of survival, faith, and forgiveness inspired millions. Louis Zamperini passed away in 2014 at the age of 97, but his legacy lives on through books, films, and the countless lives he touched. Douglas Mawson In November 1912, a three-man team embarked on a dangerous expedition across the unexplored wilderness of Antarctica. The journey would soon become one of the most harrowing tales of polar exploration. This is the story of the Australasian Antarctic Expedition, led by Douglas Mawson. In December 1911, geologist and polar explorer Douglas Mawson set sail from Australia on the ship Aurora with a team of 31 men. They aimed to explore a largely uncharted section of the Antarctic continent and carry out scientific research. Mawson was no stranger to the harsh conditions of Antarctica having previously joined Ernest Shackleton's British Antarctic Expedition from 1907 to 1909. Mawson's expertise and survival skills earned him a reputation as a seasoned explorer, but his new mission would test him like never before. After setting up a base at Cape Denison on the remote Commonwealth Bay in January 1912, the team endured fierce winds, sometimes reaching speeds of 240 kilometers per hour. Despite these extreme conditions, they managed to build a hut that still stands today. Mawson and his team spent months preparing for land expeditions into the continent's interior to conduct scientific studies, including an attempt to reach the South Magnetic Pole. In November 1912, Mawson and two companions, Lieutenant Belgrave Ninnis, 
a British army officer and dog handler, and Xavier Mertz, a Swiss cross-country skier, set out on what would later be known as the Far Eastern Shore Party. They planned to survey glaciers far from their base, hauling heavy loads of gear across treacherous, crevasse-filled ice fields. At first, the team made good progress, covering 480 kilometers by mid-December. But disaster struck on December 14th. As they crossed an ice field, Ninis and several of the expedition's strongest dogs suddenly plunged into a concealed crevasse, falling to their deaths. Along with them went most of the group's supplies, including their main tent and nearly all their food. Stranded hundreds of kilometers from base with only ten days' worth of rations, Mawson and Mertz faced an impossible task, surviving the trek back. They resorted to killing and eating their remaining dogs, but even this wasn't enough. Mertz, already weakened by the toxic effects of consuming too much dog liver, began to deteriorate rapidly. By January 7, 1913, he was delirious and suffering from terrible physical symptoms. He died the next morning. Now alone, Mawson faced a daunting 160-kilometer journey back to base, battling extreme conditions. At one point, he fell into a crevasse but miraculously survived. Day by day, he dragged himself forward, even fashioning a rope ladder in case of future falls. On January 29th, Mawson finally spotted signs of help, a note left by his teammates with food and supplies. He reached Aladdin's cave, a nearby outpost, and later made it back to base camp. By then, the expedition's ship had already left for Australia, forcing Mawson to spend another winter in Antarctica. Despite this, his expedition was considered a scientific success, and upon his return, he was knighted for his contributions to Antarctic exploration. Chilean Miners The collapse of the San Jose Mine in Chile in 2010 was a harrowing event that gripped the world for more than two months. On August 5, 33 miners began what they thought would be a routine 12-hour shift, working deep within the mine's corridors. Their supervisor, Luis Orzua, led them to a spot nearly 2,300 feet beneath the Earth's surface, surrounded by the deafening sounds of drills as they chipped away at the Earth, searching for copper and gold. Suddenly, an ominous rumble filled the air, followed by a powerful explosion. A massive boulder broke free and cascaded through the mine, causing the mountain above them to collapse. Dust clouded the tunnels, and in an instant, the miners found themselves trapped, cut off from the entrance by tons of fallen rock. They were alive but sealed in complete darkness, their exit routes blocked, and only a small supply of food and water at hand. Panic surged through the group, but Urzua quickly took charge, guiding the men to a safer area with better ventilation. Their first hope for escape was through the ventilation shafts, but when they reached them, they discovered a devastating oversight. The mine's owners had neglected to install ladders. Trapped and without a clear escape route, the miners' hopes dwindled. Over the next few days, the mine suffered another collapse, further sealing their fate. On the surface, rescue teams rushed to the scene, but they faced a daunting task, breaching a stone block weighing over 770,000 tons. The situation looked grim, and many feared that no one inside the mine could have survived the collapse. Nevertheless, the Chilean government made the miners' rescue their top priority. The state-owned mining company Codelco took over the operation, sending in experts to assess the situation. Days stretched into weeks with no sign of life. Rescue teams drilled exploratory boreholes, desperately trying to locate the men. Then, after 17 long days, one of the drill bits broke through into the cavern where the miners were trapped. From below, they heard the tap-tap of miners signaling their location. A note was soon pulled up attached to the drill. All 33 of us are fine in the shelter. Relief flooded through the rescue team, but the operation to bring the men back to the surface was far from over. They still needed to create a passage wide enough for the miners to be pulled out one by one. Drilling a tunnel through the unstable rock would take weeks. Inside the mine, Urzua had been managing the men's survival, rationing food to two spoons of tuna and half a glass of milk every 48 hours. Despite the dire circumstances, the men maintained their discipline, relying on one another and the leadership of their supervisor. On October 12th, the first miner, Florencio Avalos, ascended to the surface. He was greeted by the cheers of a nation and the world, as Chile's national anthem played in the background. 
One by one, the miners were pulled to safety. The last to emerge was Urzua, the man who had led his team through 69 days of unimaginable hardship, bringing their harrowing ordeal to an end. Though the world celebrated their survival, the scars of the experience would stay with many of the miners for the rest of their lives.